Hello, and welcome to another episode of Daily, Daily Music History. That's right. So, Bear, we've been gone for a little while. Yeah. But I think we're back. At least for now. At, at least, least for today. At least for today. And hopefully tomorrow. And hopefully tomorrow, because tomorrow we have a special video. And That's please stay tuned for that one. That's right. And so, what are we going to talk about today? What happened on February the 2nd, 19, Buddy. 1959? Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, and Big Boppu have their last show ever at Clear Lake. Clear Lake where? What state? Illinois? Iowa. Iowa. Clear Lake, Iowa. Clear Lake, Iowa. Yeah, and they played at a place called what, bud? The Surf Ball Room, which That's... I've been there before. Yeah, we've been there how many times? Twice. Yeah, I think you... Yeah, I think, I think you've been there twice. I think I've been there three times. And it's a, a really cool place. And we'll talk about the surf ballroom as we go along. But first off, the tour. Now, this was called the Winter Dance Party Tour. And one of the shocking things about it to me is its location and time. They were touring the upper Midwest in February, January and February. Um, and this particular winter of 1958-59 was really, really hard. And so by the time they started the tour, which I think was the, it was around the 25th of January, um, winter was set in deeply in these areas. And it was extremely cold. And the, the weather tended to be, you're talking about highs around uh, 20 degrees uh, Fahrenheit and lows hitting 20 to 30 below zero Fahrenheit. So it is extremely cold. I remember walking to work a couple times, well, more than a couple times, in 30 below weather. Like you blink and your eyes, your um, your uh, eyelashes will freeze together temporarily. Yeah. Every, every time you blink, that you got to kind of pull them away from each other. So it's extremely cold. Um, and it was, it was uh, not only the cold. They were traveling around in these buses, and they were old school buses, essentially. And they were no longer, they were deemed no longer fit for students to be traveling in. A lot of times they had half working heaters if the heaters worked at all. And um, so they would sit in sleeping bags on this, on this quote tour bus. They had no roadies, so everybody had to um, move their own equipment, which, you know, for a lot of bands, uh, for, for a lot of bands that are not established, it's pretty normal stuff. But the problem was they were in the in the midst of the tour. They were traveling a lot of times two to three hundred miles a day. Now that doesn't seem. I mean, that's not. That's not. It's not as bad today as it would have been in 1959. For instance, there was no interstate uh, system, so two or three hundred to four hundred miles a day today, I would not want to do, on a tour bus. That's a lot of traveling. But also, they didn't have phones, computers, none of that. Yeah, they had none of that to keep themselves occupied or, <laughs> or to, to be able to call home in the middle of the trip or anything like that. Well, I mean, in the middle of the, the, the you know, actually riding on the bus. So they were, uh, they were traveling a, a lot on two-lane roads, and they were getting very, very, very little sleep. The, the tour had no days off initially. Well, no, I take it back. Initially, they had a couple days off, but... After the tour began, the booking agency that, that scheduled the tour ended up filling in the days that they had had off. They were trying to make as much money as possible, and the best way to do that is to play every day. Unfortunately, they were continually freezing. They were sleeping very, very, very little. They had So what rest they did have was you know, probably just little dozes here and there. They were staying in sleeping bags on the, on the bus itself because it was so cold. And yet they still ended up with some massive problems. Um, uh, not, and yet they still, I mean, in addition to all this, they, they ended up with still some more problems. Uh, for instance, Richie Valens and J.P. Richardson, who's the big bopper, they both developed the flu. I don't know who else on the bus had the flu or developed it. I mean, it seems pretty uh, difficult to believe that in a cramped, cold environment like that, only two of them would have the flu. But yeah. But they, they, so they were suffering from the flu. The buses were breaking down. Uh, 
there's an individual who had, who was a Buddy Holly biographer said that, that uh, they went through five buses in 11 days. So every other day the bus was breaking down. And Carl Bunch, the drummer that uh, Buddy hired to uh, be the drummer of the backing band, essentially. All the groups used the same backing musicians. Uh, Carl Bunch developed Frostbite, I think, in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And so they ended up having to alternate drummers. Now and so they, there was a, a a member of Dion and the Belmonts uh, ended up subbing in playing the drums. Uh, Richie Valens subbed as a drummer, and Buddy Holly himself subbed as a drummer. And if you go to the Surf Ballroom, they do have a photograph of that night, uh, the the February second show, with Buddy Holly playing the drums. It's the only photo I know of that has Buddy playing the drums. Um, so while they were they were driving, like I said, they were going two or three hundred miles a day, on average, and the the tour could not have been booked in a more haphazard way. Um, if you were to give the map of the cities that they were performing in to a five year old, and told that five year old to draw a relatively logical man manner to get from one show to the next, they would have done a much better job than the individuals booking this show. Uh, it, they, it apparently was nicknamed the Tour from Hell, and for very good reason, because they were doing a lot of backtracking. So, for instance, um, they were traveling, they, they played in Clear Lake, Iowa on February the 2nd. February the 3rd, they were going to be playing in Moorhead, Minnesota, which is just across from uh, Fargo, North Dakota. And the the plane trip that uh, Buddy Holly ended up booking was to go to Fargo, and they were going to stay in Fargo and then just go to Moorhead. So going from Clear Lake to Moorhead and then straight back down to Sioux City, Iowa. So it, it makes no sense, the backtracking that they did. And if you see the, the, the map drawn out with you know the, the points of where they performed and when they performed there, the backtracking is absolutely ridiculous. And it could have cut down... Just some sort of, some sort of logical preparation before this tour started would have cut down number one a lot on the mileage, which would have meant the buses would not have broken down the way they did, the 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 musicians themselves would not have been as exhausted and just completely bone weary like they were, and anyway, you know it, it would have changed so much they would have been able to get motel rooms and and or or catch a few hours of sleep before these shows. But anyway, you know, it was a, a very, very, very miserable time. And like I said, when the, they initially started out, they had a few days off. Uh, Clear Lake, Iowa was a, a show that was booked while the tour had actually begun. And so they started out this tour thinking they were going to have February the 2nd off. And they didn't. You know, a few days into the trip, they got notification that they were to play in Clear Lake. Which I doubt was met with a bunch of you know, hoops and hollers. I bet they were pretty upset about that, actually, because that was the day that they were going to have off. So when they got to Clear Lake, uh, the bus pull pulled into the the um, parking lot of the surf ballroom, and they went into the green room, and they washed up as much as they could, basically hands and face. Uh, they went and got, got some meals and ate, and, you know, then it was shortly after short show time. Um, at the time, even though these days Buddy Holly is the one who was more remembered, uh, at the time Richie Valens was the one who was whose music was going up the charts very, very, very quickly. And um, I, I, I taught a, a class on uh, rockabilly music and punk music once, and I was talking about um, Richie Valens as being one of the most underappreciated, under-respected individuals as far as early rock and roll goes. I still hold that that uh, opinion. That was three or four years ago when I was teaching that class. I still think the same thing. Um, but Richie was performing. The Big Bopper was performing. They had uh, Dion and the Belmonts on the tour. Uh, a young up-and-comer named Frankie Sardo was performing. And then, of course, Buddy Holly. Now, in Buddy Holly's backing band, you had... Um, Tommy also playing guitar. Now, if you've ever heard the song, for instance, It's So Easy by Buddy Holly, that's Tommy also doing the lead guitar on there. He was a, 
um, a very accomplished studio musician. And um, on bass, though, was an individual who had never gone out on tour before. He's 19 years old. His name was Waylon Jennings. Now, 19? 19, I believe. And Waylon Jennings, of course, later became known as an outlaw country musician and a, a very fine, very fine musician in his own right. Well-respected career. But uh, that was the backing band. And Carl Bunch, like I said earlier, was the drummer that Buddy had hired. So they perform at the surf ballroom. Uh, if I remember correctly, Buddy was the last one to go on. Uh, people in the crowd said, you know, he seemed very anxious. Uh, he was um, not his not his usual self, let me put it that way. But they said, you know, about part, you know, part way through, close to midway through, he uh, kind of loosened up and became the Buddy Holly that they were expecting. Um, affable with the crowd, that sort of thing. Uh, smiling, joking. Now, Buddy had rented, before this performance, he had rented a plane. He had gotten tired of the bus. He was a very established musician at this time, and um, I know his wife had told him not to go on the tour, that you know this was a type of tour that an up-and-coming musician would be doing, not somebody who's established like he was. Uh, but he needed the money. He needed the money, and so he went out on the tour. And so by Clear Lake, he was fed up with the bus. The, the, everything about it was subpar, and he was just not going to put up with it anymore, so he rented a plane. And he... The, the plane he, he rented was a Beechcraft Bonanza. It seated four people. So you had the pilot and three passengers. So he was going to take a seat. And one was for Tommy Alsup, and one was for Waylon Jennings. Um, not the Big Bopper. Not the Big Bopper, yeah, not originally. And so the, the Big Bopper approached Waylon Jennings. And the Bopper told him, said, look, man, I got the flu. What I need to do is get to Fargo get a motel room, get some rest, maybe I can sleep some of this off, you know, maybe I'll wake up feeling better tomorrow. And Waylon said, you know, I think you're right. Here, you can take my seat and no problem. Now, Richie Valens, 17-year-old Richie Valens, was, uh, by reports, he was afraid to fly. Now, what Tommy Alsop says is that throughout the show, Richie would come, was coming up to him and said, man, can you give me a seat? Come on, man. Give me, give me a chance. Let me fly on the plane. And Tommy said, no, man, I'm going to go to the hotel. I'm going to get warm. I'm going to sleep. I'm going to take a shower. You know, all this stuff. And uh, so Richie kept hassling him throughout the night. And finally, at the door to the green room, which you can go to and, and see at the surf ballroom, um, Tommy was signing autographs. And Richie, or, yeah, maybe it was Richie signing. One of them was signing autographs. Sorry, I got my story mixed up. But Richie said, Tommy, one last time, man. So Tommy pulled out a coin. He said, flip the coin. He flipped it. Richie called heads, and it landed heads. So Richie was thrilled. He was going to get the seat on the plane. And he told Tommy it was the luckiest night of his life. And so um, Tommy, of course, resigned himself to going... Uh, another night on the bus, and uh, you know the rest of it's kind of history. Richie and Buddy and the Big Bopper end up getting on the plane after the show, and that's and where we're gonna leave it until next video. That's exactly right. I was gonna say we'll leave the rest of that for tomorrow. So you all have a good night. Go out and like I said, Richie Valens I think is the most what's the word I'm looking underappreciated I think of the originators of rock music is absolutely phenomenal what that what that young man did uh, when you think of what other bands were doing at the time and then you take what he was doing by himself largely by himself the songs he was writing when he was 15 16 years old absolutely remarkable that guy absolutely should uh, should be much more respected than he is and the same goes for the big bopper this is another guy who was he was um, he was really something else. He was quite the songwriter, and he doesn't get near the respect, I think, that he deserves. And Buddy, even though as, as respected as Buddy is, he's, he's my lifetime love as far as music goes. He's the, the one I couldn't do without, and I still think uh, he's, he's, he's under-respected under as well, as much as he is respected. So anyway, go listen to some Buddy. Definitely listen to Richie. Definitely listen to the Big Bopper. 
And uh, have yourself a good night, and we'll see you tomorrow. Bye!